Allies liberate the German-held island of Elba off the coast of Italy. A heavy bombardment of shore installations precedes the attack. A smoke screen covers the landing. British commandos, French Senegalese, and Goumiers swarm ashore amidst German gunfire. It is a fairly quick landing for some, but others have trouble as the uneven shore bottom makes footing uncertain. Army mules show that they don't like being amphibious. Troops push inland to wipe out enemy strongholds on this important island. In less than 24 hours, the entire western half of Elba is in Allied hands, and 1,800 prisoners are captured. Elba, scene of Napoleon's first exile, the Germans meet another defeat. At his secret mountain headquarters somewhere in Yugoslavia is the leader of the embattled Yugoslav Army of Liberation, Marshal Tito. Tito is shown here with the first Allied war correspondence to reach his headquarters. The town of Dravar, which has changed hands six times in bitter fighting between partisans and the enemy. Now, fighting Yugoslavs go about their business behind the German lines. Women salvage silk from allied parachutes used to drop supplies for partisan troops. It will be used as bandages for their army. Many of Tito's fighters were students before the German invasion. Young Montenegrins, among them a 21-year-old girl hero who left school to join the partisans. Women fight side by side with the men, marching against the enemy wherever found. disciplined force training in Italy under their own officers. Soldiers like this have given a good account of themselves before the enemy and have caused the Germans to divert large forces in order to oppose them. As United Nations armies close in on Nazi Germany, they owe much to a small but gallant people and their valiant leader, Marshal Tito. General George Marshall, U.S. Army Chief of Staff, visits with General Mark Clark at an advance headquarters in Italy. Upon General Alphonse Juin of the French Army, he confers the Distinguished Service Medal. Here, just a few days after his tour of the Normandy beachhead, Marshall meets officers of the 5th Army sweeping northward in an advance that has averaged as high as 25 miles a day. 
General Marshall sees for himself the progress of Allied arms in this important theater of war. Task Force 58, part of the U.S. 5th Fleet and the most powerful destructive unit in the history of sea warfare, guards Marine and Army troops en route to Saipan in the Marianas. Bypassing Kruk and many other enemy islands, this armada drives to within 1,500 miles of Tokyo in one of the most daring operations of the war. These mighty vessels, under the command of Admiral Raymond Spruance, are part of the sea air forces which have shot down 750 Jap planes, blasted 100 ships in recent battles. A four-day combined bombardment pours thousands of tons of explosives into Saipan. rope ladders into landing barges go the Marines. On shore at Anginggan Point, on Saipan's southwest corner, infantry and tanks strike simultaneously up the length of the island and straight across its southern tip. Deep inland, artillery pounds a ridge above Point Nafutan. fighters, hundreds of them, move steadily in. Beyond this ridge is Magician Bay, the capture of which isolated Jap defenders of southern Saipan. The biggest prize of the initial fighting is Aslito Airfield, exactly 1,465 miles from the capital of Japan. Here, Jap installations are in ruins. The strip is put to our own use. A carrier-based Hellcat lands. Our casualties are heavy. With cool and tireless efficiency, Medical men labor to save every possible life. <music> Japanese women and children receive kindly care. Outside a prisoner of war depot, they are assembled for transport to safety. Supplies pour ashore at a rate of 10,000 tons a day as the advance continues on to Garapan, principal settlement of Saipan. <laughs> 